Hey. Good morning, all. So in the last class, we were looking at the formal definition of regular expressions. So basically, there are six cases in the formal definition of a regular expression, three primitive cases and three complex cases. The primitive cases are like um, either you have a single symbol from the alphabet set, like A, B, C, whatever it is, or epsilon or null set. And complex cases are union, concatenation, and star operations. Okay, these six cases cover all the possible um, variants of regular expressions. Okay, so let's um, move on. In the last class, we ended with identity operations. So phi is the identity element for union operation, whereas epsilon is the identity element for concatenation operation. But if you exchange them, the identity operations no longer hold. Like um, R union epsilon will not be R because it will be R plus epsilon, right? And uh, similarly, R dot phi will not be R, it will be phi. Why? Because for any concatenation, you need to have both the elements. So if I'm doing A dot B, I need to have both A and B. But in the case of R dot phi, you don't have B. B is empty. So you cannot concatenate with anything. All right, when you don't have the second element, concatenation itself is not possible. So basically concatenation is not feasible at all. So you end up with no result. So hence the result is an empty set, okay? So let me put that in uh, writing. Concatenating the empty set to any set yields the empty set since the concatenation operation with a set with no strings is not feasible at all. If A and B are sets, We define A dot B equal to A B such that A belongs to A and B belongs to B. If B is a null set. There are no objects B belonging to B. So there are no objects A, B, such that A belongs to A and B belongs to B. 
दस ए डॉट फाइव इक्वल टू फाइव ओके सो सिंस देर आर नो ऑब्जेक्ट्स बी बिलोंगिंग टू बी there will be no objects such that a belongs to a and b belongs to b because even if one of these conditions is false this entire compound condition is false all right so finally you will end up with an empty set okay and um, now let's look at some applications of regular expressions i already mentioned them but uh, again let me put that in writing regular expressions are widely used in text editors for string searching this we discussed already right that fishing example so if you want to search for all kinds of words uh, that start with fish fishing fisherman fisheries all those things in one shot you use regular expressions otherwise if you don't use regular expressions the only ways you have to look for every variant every suffix separately so you have to search for fishing you have to search for fisherman you have to search for fisheries separately and then match each variant of that word okay but regular, using regular expressions you can do you can match all of them in one shot all right and um, they are also used in automatically generating lexical analyzers what is a lexical analyzer that is the part of a compiler that initially processes the tokens or lexemes of an input program so like you all know when you compile maybe c code or c++ code whatever it is you get an a dot out file right so this compilation process it's not a one stage thing it has multiple stages the first stage is lexical analysis that is when you give the program to the computer that entire program is one single string for the computer it does not make a distinction between a character and a space everything is a character for that okay so it does not know what words are and what non words are what what is the useful character in that and what is not useful character in that everything is equal to that so this entire thing is one string for that so the first step which a compiler does is to break up this entire string into multiple units um uh, units like words um operators and uh, punctuation marks right so if i have um, so suppose if i have some statement like um, say total equal to say count plus 25 something now technically this entire thing is like one string for the computer so what the lexical analyzer does it breaks it into useful units which are called as tokens or lexemes um lexeme is again a grammatical construct uh, in the beginning i told you if you pay attention to language you will understand the meaning of a word even without looking up dictionary 
you heard of phonemes? Phonemes, you okay? Um, graphemes, phonemes, um, lexemes are one. So basically, anything ending with eme, not mean, other emes like lexeme, phoneme, grapheme, these represent basic units of that particular category. Phoneme, can you guess? Uh, it's a basic unit of what? Sound, right? Something phonos. Basically, phonos means sound. So everything related to phone, telephone, gramophone, uh, saxophone, phonetics, phonology, all these things have to do with sound. Um, so phonetics means study of sounds. Phonemes means the basic unit of sounds. So even syllables, what we call as syllables, they are further composed of phonemes. Even a syllable can be broken down into smaller sounds. Like if I say syllable itself, how many syllables are there in this word? Three, right? C, L, B. Now, each of these syllables itself is composed of further units, phonemes, like C is composed of S and E. So it is represented using some other, when you open a dictionary, sometimes you find a different um, representation, phonetic representation that actually captures the sound of how you should pronounce it, right? So those are uh, made of phonemes. Phonemes basically are sounds, phonetics are visual representation. Um, so S, E, and then L. L, A, B, B, L. So this is, it is made up of six phonemes. Okay. So these are what we call as uh, aksharas in Indian languages, because Indian languages are phonetic languages. What you write is what you read. Whereas English is not a phonetic language. You write something, you speak something. That's why English is called a cut, put, put language. If CUT is cut, why is PUT not put, but put? If PUT is put, why is BUT not book, but, but, right? So there is no logic as to why you pronounce the words in one particular way, although the spelling is same, the construction is same, but the pronunciations are different. So you write something, you speak something. Whereas uh, in all Indian languages, they are phonetic languages because the name of the oval is its sound itself. Whereas in English, the not oval, the name of the character or the symbol is it sound itself. Whereas in English, the name of the character is something, it sound is something else, right? So that is one thing. So phonemes are basic units of sounds. Similarly, lexemes are basic units of um, written symbols. Lexicon is what? What is a lexicon? Huh? No, lexicon basically means a dictionary. Lexicon means dictionary, lexicology, and all those things, those are study of uh, writings. So the basic units of writing, those are lexemes. Graphemes means basic units of visual representations. All right. Um, yeah, sorry. Lexicons means basic units of um, any words. Um, so the letters which you use. Graphemes means the way you represent these letters. Okay, like uh, I may uh, choose to write uh, like numbers if you take, I can write them in Roman numerals as well as uh, English uh, numbers, Arabic, Hindu, uh, Arabic numerals, right? So that is a different way of representing. Similarly, I can choose to write English letters in Telugu script. That is another way. So here graphemes are changing, lexemes are not changing. Okay. Anyway, so in this case, a lexeme is not uh, the letter, but each of these words are symbols. So this is a lexeme, this is a lexeme, this is a lexeme, and so on. So each of the units which are useful to you, it, there is no use in breaking down further each of these words, like total, I can break it down further, but that's of no use to me. This is a variable. I want to use this variable as a unit. Okay, so this is a, a basic lexical unit for me. All right, so lexical units in any program are lexemes. 
token is sort of used when uh, you are making a distinction between type and token type means a category of things and tokens means instances of that category or class like um, if i say a uh, set of people is the type whereas each individual person is a token similarly in a program you will have different types of uh, entities like you will have words you will have numbers you will have operators you will have punctuation marks you will have all these things so each one is a token belonging to a particular type so total is a token belonging to the type word uh, equal to is a token belonging to the type operator uh, semicolon is a token belonging to the type punctuation marks right so basically given a program you break it down into tokens and then using these tokens you go to the next stage so the first stage is just breaking down an entire program which is a single string into multiple tokens once these tokens are given to you you go to the next stage like that will be evident if we take an example like say uh, 3 plus say 20 into 5 something now what is the uh, value of this expression 1 or 3 why because we are first multiplying 20 with 5 and then adding 3 with this entire thing okay we are not first adding 3 with 20 and then multiplying it with 5 right although multiplication came later it is being performed first why because it has a higher precedence and how does the computer understand the higher precedence of multiplication basically what it does is it constructs something called a parse tree so when you give this expression to a computer it constructs a tree like this addition i add 3 and then i add 3 to an expression which is the multiplication expression which has 20 and 5 as its operands so first this expression is evaluated i will get 100 then this 100 plus 3 is done then i will get 1 or 3 but suppose if i change the order uh, i i just change the tree okay i define order slightly differently i will say addition has higher precedence so it should come low it should come at a lower level in the tree whatever operator comes at Uh, at the bottom of the tree that will have the highest precedence okay so it is multiplication of two expressions the left expression is an addition expression of 3 and 20 and the right expression is a single number 5 so here you first add 3 and 20 you get 23 and then you multiply 23 with 5 you get 115 so you see the values are different because the precedence has changed so the only way computer understand this precedence is through these trees so a tree actually gives you a hierarchy so these are the kinds of examples where data structures are useful right so this data structure tells you how to proceed but if you have given it in a line how will you know this right so the data structure plays a very important role here because you are using a tree data structure you are able to capture hierarchy if you are using a graph data structure you will be able to capture relationships if you are using a stack data structure you will be able to capture um, um sequence like what is first what is last kind of a thing so each data structure has its own significance right so you can't do it's not like you can't do one task with another data structure you can sort of do in principle because finally on ram everything is an array so technically everything can be done using arrays array data structure but some data structures are more um uh, more convenient to do some tasks that's the main thing okay anyway so compiler has multiple stages first stage is lexical analyzer then syntax analyzer then uh, semantic analyzer there are different things for lexical analyzer stage regular expressions are useful they help you in breaking down your entire program which is a single sentence into multiple tokens or lexical units okay other stages this tree itself is not part of lexical analyzer it is part of syntax analyzer it will come later but first stage regular expressions are used okay so this is another application of regular expressions you will learn more about it later in compiler course all right so let's move on
So let's look at some examples now. So yeah, so before we move on, um, I would just like to mention one more thing. Union can be represented either using this symbol or it can also be represented using plus. Okay, so sometimes if you look up some online resources related to TOC, you may find this um, representation also. So both are fine. Either you can use plus or you can use the union symbol. Okay. So what is the language represented by this regular expression? Zero union, one whole star. In words, how do you describe this? Hmm? String of zeros and ones. Okay. Any string of zeros and ones? All zeros or all ones only. So a string should have only one kind of symbol. Okay. What else? Huh? Empty string. So this stands for empty string. Yeah, but what I'm asking is, does this represent only an empty string? Huh? Okay. String of any length. Sorry. Okay. String of any length with what symbols? Either zero or one, like what she said. Only zeros or only ones? String with zeros and ones. It can be a combination also. And with zeros and ones, is there a limitation or any kind of string with zeros and ones? Any string with zeros and ones. And also empty string. Okay. Um, we discussed this. I think you people don't remember. What is this in terms of uh, sigma? It is sigma star. Sigma star means all possible strings that can be built out of zeros and ones. So it's not only strings which have only zeros or only ones. It can be any string that can be built out of zeros and ones, including the empty string. Okay. So so I don't know why it is so confusing. It basically says you can choose zero or one, zero or more times. So right now I choose a zero, then I choose a one, then again I choose a one, again I choose a zero, 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 anything. And I can go on. So I can build any string of any length of any characters. That's it. So basically, this is a set of all possible strings of all possible lengths. of zeros and ones including the empty string okay now let me show you why this will be equal to sigma star this expression itself need not be equal to sigma star unless sigma is only 0, 1. Even if sigma is more than 0, 1, this expression will still mean this. 0 union 1 whole star indicates all possible strings of all possible lengths that can be made up of zeros and ones, including epsilon. It is independent of sigma star. If sigma is equal to 0, 1, then it is also equal to sigma star. Okay? So 
right now we'll consider that case only if sigma is equal to 0 1 then 0 union 1 so this regular expression in terms of sets how do you convert this i said every regular expression is nothing but sets operation on sets so what are the sets here 0 and 1 right so 0 union 1 and what is that 0 1 right so 0 union 1 is nothing but epsilon which means 0 union 1 star is not, not epsilon i'm sorry sigma 0 union 1 star is nothing but sigma star so that is why 0 union 1 star is sigma star it's not through fluke or approximation that we are saying that because 0 union 1 is a simpler way of representing 0 1 set and uh, 0 1 set whole star is sigma star okay so I, I mentioned earlier also sigma star can be represented in multiple ways like 0 union 1 star or 0 star 1 star whole star both both of them represent sigma star only or you can also sort of say it as 0 comma 1 whole star okay so all these cases indicate the same thing okay um what about this regular expression sigma star 1 what language does it represent yeah set of all strings ending with a 1 that's all set of all strings that end with a 1 okay um what about this one zero sigma star union sigma star one yeah so set of all strings which start with a zero or end with a one what if i want to capture all those strings which start with a zero and end with a one what will be the regular expression then intersection okay that is one answer yeah you don't even need intersection zero sigma star one that is enough this will capture the end condition okay so first this is all strings set of all strings that start with a zero or end with a one. And this is same thing where or is replaced with end. You need to check the textbook for more examples. I'll not cover all of them here. Okay, so like um, arithmetic operators have precedence, like we saw just now, multiplication, division have higher precedence than addition and subtraction. Similarly, 
regular regular operations also have precedence so precedence of regular operations is star has a higher precedence than concatenation than union okay all right so now let's move on to the next section that is equivalence of regular expressions with finite automata so can anyone tell me how regular expression and a finite automaton can be related union what is the relation between a regular expression and a finite automaton how can they be related yeah but why how can you say that it's because i'm telling you you are repeating that exactly they are related through regular language so a regular expression describes a regular language and a regular language is accepted by a finite automaton so whichever particular uh, finite automaton accepts or recognizes the regular language described by this regular expression this regular expression is said to be equivalent to that particular finite automaton okay so we depict that so you have uh, finite automaton and a regular language and a regular expression so a regular expression describes a regular language and a finite automaton recognizes a regular language so these two in turn are equivalent okay so now let's move on to the next theorem a language is regular if and only if some regular expression describes it so basically if there is a re regular language there will be some regular expression describing it similarly if there is a regular expression then the language that it is describing will be regular okay so both the directions are uh, true now any guesses on how we prove this theorem
Yeah, we know that each regular expression stands for a language, but we don't know whether that language is regular or not. We need to prove that. Hmm? So we have to make a DM. Yes. Yeah. You got it? In the primitive cases, whatever cases I mentioned, I also said that each regular expression stands for a set, which is a language. Like A stands for a set with only one string A. Epsilon stands for a set with one uh, element epsilon. Null set stands for an empty set, right? Now, each of these are languages. We know that. But when you get into complex cases or whatever, um, how do you know that the language being represented by this regular expression is a regular language? The only way is you build a finite automaton for that. Because regular language by definition is something which is accepted or recognized by a finite automaton. So if you can build a finite automaton for every regular expression or come up with a general method to convert any regular expression into a finite automaton, then the language that is recognized by this regular expression will also be, sorry, the language described by this regular expression will also be the language recognized by this finite automaton. We will show that as well. So then we can say, because this language which, be, which is being described by the regular expression is being accepted by a finite automaton, it is a regular language. Okay? And the other way around, if you know some language is regular, you should show that it is uh, convertible to a regular expression. <clears throat> Again, you do it through automata. You show a method of converting any automaton to a regular expression. Then you can prove that. Okay? So basically, we have NFA or DFA coming in between. Um, so a finite automaton is equivalent to regular languages. Okay, so let's assume this is statement one. This is statement two. And uh, this is statement three. So first statement says that regular languages and regular expressions are equivalent. This is the theorem. We want to prove that. Uh, second statement says that regular languages and uh, finite automaton are equivalent. This is sort of already proved because uh, that's the definition. By definition, regular language is that which is accepted by a finite automaton. That's it. So two is like given. You need not prove it. Three, we need to prove that finite automaton, finite automata are equivalent to regular expressions. So this we need to prove. So since one, we cannot prove directly, we prove two and three. One is equivalent to proving two and three. If we can prove two and three, that will automatically imply one. All right. So. Two and three imply one. Two is already proved. By definition, three should be proven now. Right? Now, three itself has two directions. Okay? We need to prove both the directions separately. Since P by implies Q is equivalent to P implies Q and Q implies P. Step three, Q 
can be proved or can be broken into two parts first part that a regular expression can be converted to an nfa or dfa and the second part is that an nfa or dfa can be converted to a regular expression okay so this theorem has two directions as mentioned above that is 3a and 3b we state and prove each direction as a separate lemma so if you remember the sequence of uh, proving something you start with axioms you prove lemmas in between using which you prove theorems and from theorems uh, corollaries are followed so sometimes directly using axioms we prove theorems or sometimes we prove lemmas in between and then theorems so here we will break down this theorem into two lemmas we will prove these lemmas and that will indirectly prove the theorem okay so we will prove both the directions that given the regular expression you show that it is describing a regular language the other direction is given the regular language it will have a regular expression for it okay so so the first lemma says that if a language is described by a regular expression then it is regular okay so what is the proof idea say that we have a regular expression r describing some language a we show how to convert r into an nfa recognizing a it doesn't matter whether you convert it into nfa or dfa because both are equivalent and since nfa is easier we will just convert it to nfa okay so that will not uh, reduce the quality of proof in any way or the strength of the statement in any way by 
corollary 1.4 so this is from the textbook i'm using that textbook numbering uh, i'm also mentioning it here if an nfa recognizes a then a is regular okay so we are taking recourse to nfa so i know regular expression recognize a uh, regular expression describes some language but that particular language is regular or not i don't know so what i will do i will build an nfa which recognizes this particular language so since this language being described by this regular expression is recognized by a particular nfa this language will become regular okay so this is the first step or uh, the first case that is 3a that is converting regular expression to nfa all right so let's get into the proof let's convert r into an nfa n we consider six cases in the formal definition of regular expressions right so here we gave six cases right while defining a regular expression formally so if we can show that each of these six cases can be converted into an nfa then it is like saying that any regular expression can be converted to nfa that's it so that's like covering all possible cases and uh, uh, proving the general statement that any regular expression can be converted to nfa all right okay so let's start with the first case r equal to a for some a belonging to sigma now what will be the language of r if r is a what is the language of r what is this regular expression describing huh set yeah it's a singleton set with a that is the only string that's all so a represents this set this language okay um and the following nfa recognizes l of r so what is the nfa to recognize a how many states will it have and what are the transitions okay two states on a it goes to q2 okay hmm this is nfa you don't need dead states that's it this is a nfa which accepts only one string with only one symbol that is a that's it it will not accept anything else it will not accept a a triple a nothing it will accept only a okay so 
we will also describe it formally so formally n is despitable where it has two states q1 q2 sigma sigma can be anything sigma need not be only a or ab or whatever sigma can be anything but the language is having only a so this is the nfa which accepts only a a just needs to belongs to sigma there can be other elements also in sigma and um, delta we will come to it in a minute start state is q1 and final state final set of states has only one state that is q2 where we describe delta by saying that delta q1 comma a equal to q2 and that delta rb equal to null set for r not equal to q1 or b not equal to a which means in every other case there is no transition it just goes to an empty set all right okay let's quickly cover one more case r equal to epsilon then what is the language of r hmm set having epsilon and uh, the following nfa recognizes l of r so what is the nfa that recognizes epsilon hmm one state okay that is also the accept state then that's it this is the nfa that accepts epsilon one some people also represent it like this like you have epsilon transition to the second state this is also fine but this is more optimal and this is simpler you don't need this okay so we'll just describe this one so formally n is this five tuple with only one state q1 and sigma can be anything delta can be anything i'll come to that and um, start state is q1 and final state is also q1 where delta rb is null set for any r and b that's it there are no transitions at all in this machine so delta rb is null set okay let's stop here